a great crowd. It was a great crowd last night, too. I'm going to show this Sunday morning crowd something I've never shown anybody before. This is the first time up here. Last time I was here, I think it was uh, January of 17, if I'm not mistaken, and there was a TV crew. I, I asked pastor's permission. Someone uh, called my wife. She had, she had put a Facebook message on President Barack Obama's wall, and she said, I want to thank you for your service. We, I prayed for you. And I, she told me, and I said, why did you do that? She said, nobody will ever see that. Well, MSNBC sent a news crew to this church and, uh, in, and filmed me preaching. And then the next day or the two days later, there's a picture, I think, of, a, of an interview. It's, a, it's a three ladies and a picture of my wife. And I think I mailed that, emailed that this morning. Maybe I didn't. Pretty sure I did. Yeah, there it is. And they all wore purple. It's like they had a memo or something. Nobody even knew what the other one was wearing. Lady in the middle is the MSNBC lady. Now look at the next fo photograph. The next photograph. That's, that's my living room. And they set up all that junk in my living room because nobody will ever see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did the interview, and uh, they ran into a wonderful Holy Ghost-filled buzzsaw in my wife, and she just gave them honest answers and just shared the gospel of Jesus Christ and even asked the lady, can we just pray for <laughs> right now? <laughs> yeah. They interviewed us for hours, and the, it never made the air because it was mostly about Jesus. <laughs> and that's the way I like it. <laughs> well, I, I, I also, because I feel such a kindred spirit with this church, I want to uh, give you some statistics. I just read in my regular Bible time this morning, in fact, at the hotel, from Corinthians, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And, the, and it's in King James, says, glory in the Lord. I want to boast in the Lord. In 11 and a half years as an evangelist, at leaving my wonderful little church in Huntington, West Virginia as a pastor, we've made 1,371 presentations to 335,562 people in 25 states, in 166 cities, 176 churches, 7 countries, 54 revivals, 136 comedy shows, and 7,097 people have given their hearts to Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord some praises. I know that's not world record stuff, but I'm telling you, from where I came from, I just want to thank God. Only God can do that. Thank the Lord for that. And there are a couple of images before I preach I want to just share with you that, that kind of motivate me on the road when I get up in a different hotel uh, all over the, the country. One of them is a train. Now, some of you may be uh, from this part of the world where they, they, they have trains like this. Uh, if you've ever, has anybody ever seen this live and in person where there's a train with that much humanity on it? You can't get another person on that train. That, that motivates me because I believe there's a train bound for heaven, and my job is to get everybody on it. That's, what, that's my job and your job. <clears throat> and then there's another picture. It's a, it's a kayak or a canoe. I lived on Lake of the Ozarks when I was a freshman in high school. My neighbor guy, he said, you want to go fishing? Of course, I'm 15. I want to go fishing with that old man with the bib overalls. So we got in his bass boat, and we went way down Lake of the Ozarks. And then we cut off into a tributary on, in, his little, in his boat, pulling my canoe all the way until we couldn't go any further. After about three hours, he tied up his boat, and he canoed way back yonder into the, into the creeks. And I caught 15 giant white bass that day. It was the best day of fishing I ever had. So my job is not always a big stages in the beautiful churches like this. Sometimes it's storming the tributaries. Like last year when I went down to South Alabama, 1,300 miles. They, this is a brand new church. It cost me money to go. They couldn't afford the, uh, hardly an offering to cover my expense. They did the best they could. 13% of the morning crowd got saved that day, but don't get excited. There were only 16 people in the room, <laughs> including me. The two people that got saved that day, one was a teenager going through a horrible divorce at home with his parents, and the other was a first-time visitor from Florida that just showed up out of the blue. That's going back in the, in the backwaters. That's catching a tough fish. And this church is like this. Help me to do it tomorrow. God willing, I'll be getting on a plane going to Bangkok, Thailand, through Seoul, Korea, and then on up to Chiang Rai the next day to work with Terry Wasner. And we, we may tell you a little bit more about that since I was put on the spot while ago by the, the gentleman that put you a little bit more about that tonight. What helps us is uh, offerings like this, and thank you so much for giving the resource table. Uh, I 
told them last night, you can get my book on Amazon for $13, but today, this weekend especially, it's one book for $20. I've never been good at math. But when you buy a book for $20, you put a book in the hand of a Teen Challenge student like this one. These are boys in North Carolina. I was in Philadelphia, and a, a lady called me and said, uh, Pastor Joe, I know it's late on a Sunday night, but I just had to tell you, you know, you helped my son get in a Teen Challenge. And he called me he called me today and said, Mom, I read Pastor Joe's book three times. I guess that's all you can do in Teen Challenge is read. I don't know what. And he said, the, the light finally came on for me. He was almost dead with a heroin overdose. That's not an exaggeration. He almost had died with a heroin overdose. Went in Teen Challenge, read the book three times, and today he's studying for the ministry in New England. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Little girls down at Smith Station, Alabama. We even give them to older people, too, like these ladies from the Columbus, Georgia Teen Challenge. This is the next picture. Do you have another picture? Yeah, like these ladies here. So you buy one, you get one. I only have about 19 left. I gave one to a kid that hit me in the stomach last night. Long story. <laughs> Long story. Take your Bibles. Turn to 2 Samuel. Tonight I'd like to tell you that, uh, and oh, by the way, I do take credit cards and cash, chickens, uh, bags of cough drops. Tonight I want to pray for sick people. We're going to pray and believe God to heal people in their bodies, mind, soul, and spirit. He's a mighty God, and he loves to heal, and I have felt his presence so strongly here among you. Somebody here must be praying. There must be people in this church that fast. I can sense it. I can sense the power of God. We're going to believe God for that tonight. This morning, in the next 35 or 40 minutes, I want to preach a faith-building word for 2019 that gives you permission slip to go after what God has gone after for you, okay? So that's the deal. Thank you, Lord, for the, my friend, the newbie. I love him so much, and the staff here, and the people, and all the friends I've had for decades in this church, the great history in this church. And I know they've already thanked you a lot, Lord. I know they have. But as a guest evangelist, you've been here a few times. <laughs> I'd like to say another thank you for letting this project get completed and how you have touched all the details of this thing. It's been so good, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, and sort of illustrates even the message that I want to speak today. I pray now that you'll let us hear clearly what your Holy Spirit wants to say to this local body and to these individuals. Pray it in the name of Jesus and to the glory of God. And everybody said, October 24th, 1990, 19 and 26 on October the 24th. They call it Black Thursday. It was a dark day in American history, October 24th, 1929. It was a dark day in American history. That's the, pr the precursor of Black Tuesday. Americans lost fortunes. Americans lost more money on that day in five hours than the entire World War I war expenditure combined. Five hours. Will Rogers was in New York. He's a commentator of, of fame and he said uh, of that day, you, you had to stand in line to get an open window to jump out of, being facetious. But people were taking their lives. One guy lost $5 million. In 1929, that was an incredible fortune. It's an incredible fortune today. He lo lost $5 million in five hours. He owned a gas company, and ironically, he laid down on his kitchen table and turned the gas on and took his life. He lost everything. What, what, what do you do when you lose everything? That's the message today. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor, for bringing that guy in. Last night he says they're coming to kill us, and now we're going to lose everything. <laughs> That's a prognostication of faith, that guy. No, no, no. It, it, loss is part of life. What, do you do? what happens to us when, it, when the earth gets wet? My, my brother-in-law, yesterday was his 55th birthday, dropped dead August 16th. And my, my nieces and my nephew and my sister-in-law, they're reeling from that. I worked for a guy in Georgia that was a hero of mine. And I have permission from his family to tell the story. Roger Brumbelo was a great preacher of the gospel. I worked for him for a year here in Atlanta. He, he had, had a, a physical malady, a brain tumor, I think. And, and in just like that, he'd lost his ability to speak and his preaching was gone. And he was a world-class golfer, played golf all over the, the world and some of the best courses in the world. Lost his golf game, couldn't, couldn't swing a golf club. Lost his health, lost his job, lost his ministry. And if that wasn't enough, his precious, sweetest woman you ever meet, his precious wife died. 
I, I still can't get my mind around that. This story here is about somebody who lost everything. It's uh, about David in Second Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. I'm reading from the New King James this year. I try to read a different version every year and a half. And when I got to the Amplified, it took me six years to read that. But anyway, <laughs> first, this must be a biblically literate crowd. <laughs> first Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. Now, it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. And Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. And they did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Verse 3, chapter 30, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 3. So David and his men came to the city, and there it was, there it was, burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. David's two wives, Ahinanab, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Verse 6, now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. So what do you do when you lose it all? Now, church, tonight I'm going to be talking something from the New Testament, much more positive subject matter, but this is reality. Loss is part of life. Even if you're a great winner, before Hank Aaron came along, the, the Babe Ruth was the man that had the record for the most home runs, but he also had the record for strikeouts, 1,330. Five times he led the American League in strikeouts. Loss is it's just part of this thing we call life. My sons last month or two months ago, both my boys, my 30-year-old preacher, pastor, Joseph, and my 23-year-old accountant, son, Kenan, they both lost something in the same week. My son's storage uh, unit was completely raided and uh, all of his baseball cards from his grandpa guitars and all of his sporting equipment gone just gone just like that my son Kenan has some computer and some headphones wireless headphones in the back seat of his car broken into gone that's really not a big deal I mean you know loss has different levels down here in the deep south I heard him talking about somebody lost three or four football games and they were talking about getting a GoFundMe to buy out the coach's contract because they couldn't take the loss couldn't take a loss. What David lost was not a football game. It was not wireless headphones. Now, now here, here's the backdrop for David. David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, he killed Goliath. You know the story. And, um, and he is advancing in the kingdom of heaven, and he's advancing professionally until his boss loses his mind and tries to kill him. And so he has to flee for his life. And he, fly, uh, he flees to King Achish, who's the king of the Philistines. If you know your Bible, remember, Goliath was a Philistine. So David, I read this again in another part just today in my hotel in a regular reading of my devotional time with the Lord. David tells Solomon, I can't, I've got all the plans. I've got all kind of plans for the temple, but I can't build it because I, my hands are full of blood. I'm a man of war, and God said, I can't do it, but you're going to do it, Solomon. So when you're a warrior and you lose your job, you get fired by Saul, what do you do? It's like me as a preacher. If I didn't have this, I don't know nothing else. I don't even really know how to turn light bulbs into the socket real good. I'd, I'd, be, day, I'd be gone just under a tree somewhere. Bring me some. What do you do when you're David and you don't have a job? Well, he's a warrior, and he's very, very good at it. So he becomes a mercenary. He hires himself out to King Achish. Now, King Achish says, hey, come here, David. All you boys, I like you. You're going to get Ziklag. This city called Ziklag is all yours. Bring all your boys and all your animals and wives and children. Come on, take over. And it was a good deal for David, the missionary, hiring himself out to the highest bidder. So he, he gets all 600 of his guys, and they go marching up to Jezreel. In Jezreel, they're forming a, a, a battle to go against the people of God. Now, put your head around that just a second here. David, a man after God's own heart, is leading 600 men to go fight against God's people. Three days. When he gets up to Achish, the king calls him into his tent, probably went something like this. Hey, David, hey, thanks for coming in. Hey, man, you know I like you. You got a lot of spunk, but 
here's the deal. I met with some of my guys, you know, and here's my, my team can't work with you. I like you. You got a lot of fire. You're really good at it, but they can't work with you, and so we're going to have to let you go. His, the king's people said, this guy's going to be a spy, and he'll, he'll kill all of us. So now he's lost his job with Saul. He's lost three days journeying up to this city of Jezreel. He's got to look at 600 boys and say, remember how I told you to follow me up here? Guess what? We're going to go back home. Yeah, we're going to go back home. Follow me back home. When he gets home, the Amalekites had paid a visit. The Amalekites had found out David's out. He's gone. And they were really notorious people for coming in and plundering a city, stealing all the stuff and stealing people and making them slaves. But David had been so cruel to the Amalekites once they got all the stuff and all the people and all the wives and all the children, going to make them slaves of whatever kind. He, the Amalekites look at each other and say, you think of what I'm thinking? Let's burn it to the ground, baby. So they burn it to the ground. David, he's that last mile. You know, it's always the last mile that's the toughest mile when you're trying to get home. You know, because we're almost there, boys. We're almost there. And when they come to Ziklag, it is burnt to the ground and the people are losing their mind everything and everyone is gone what do you do when you lose it all they say there are seven stages of grief if you look at the internet it's different lists different things and there's shock and denial and pain and guilt and anger and bargaining and depression and upward turn reconstruction and then finally acceptance and hope and I don't have time for seven steps along the way but I want to just visit quickly five train stops that David made when he had lost it all and I want to remind all of you here in this great church that we have yes an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous but we also have an enemy of our soul who comes to steal kill and destroy and burn it to the ground so what do you do when you lose first stop david had to make was he he grieved he grieved the bible says he grieved till there was no more power to weep he said is there anything more pitiful than seeing a grown strong man i'm talking about a warrior marine army ranger an athlete, a professional athlete who is openly weeping. It's, it's moving. God broke his leg in a playoff game last week. I was listening to it on the radio, driving down to Montgomery, and they, they, he broke his leg, and they said they, as they carted him off, he, he, he was just weeping. And who wouldn't when you're, you've lost your career, or you lost your season, or you lost your ability to walk, and he's weeping. One professional athlete, Derek Rose, uh, he, he had a great early career but he busted out his knee so many times didn't think he was going to have a career he scored 50 points this season they interviewed him on the way off the court couldn't even talk he was crying so hard these men these tough warriors they sit down and they weep that's an important place to stop when you lose a job a relationship a contract a marriage your health it's all right to sit down and weep. And when we grieve, I feel like we have to do a couple of things. Number one, we've got to own it. We've got to own it. Now, like I said last night, my sister-in-law had nothing to do with her husband dropping dead in the Georgia clay. But David, David is reaping of his own doing. He is paying what we said last night is idiot tax. I don't know if you've ever paid idiot tax. I paid enough for all of us. What is idiot tax? Bounce check, speeding ticket, you know, a late fee on the... He, he is probably saying to himself, what, what an idiot. What have I done? What if I'd have stayed in Judah? What if I'd have trusted God? What if I'd have stayed at Ziklag with my wife and children? What if I hadn't been so mean to the Amalekites? What if I hadn't attached myself to a heathen king? you got to own it and stop blaming everybody else for some stuff that happens that's of our own making. That's just me. They, that's why David's a man after God's own heart. He prays in his psalm. Again, I have sinned against you and you alone have I sinned, O oh God. I have sinned. Not her, and not him, and not the committee. I have sinned. You, not only do you have to own it, but you have to feel it. When you grieve, you feel it physically with all five senses. He walks into his city, 
and he's not going to taste the meal that is normally prepared for a warrior. He's, he's, he, can't, he can't see the city anymore, but he can see the smoke. He doesn't hear his children running up to him, but he can hear his men weeping. That acrid city gets into his nostrils. He can't feel the embrace and the love of his, of his family. you got to feel it. Acts 8, 2 says, And godly men mourn greatly for Stephen. It's a godly thing to mourn. Another version says, Make great lamentation over Stephen. It's a godly thing to mourn. In fact, we can't skip it. I, I remember early as in Georgia being a, a youth pastor. I, I wasn't even a youth pastor. I was 18 years old, just born again. And in our church, a very prominent man had lost his family in a very tragic situation. His wife was nearly killed, was not uh, actually killed, eventually recovered, took years. Two of his children were killed. And I remember going to the funeral. I'd never even been to a Christian funeral that I knew of. And uh, the man smiled the entire way through it, and he worshiped, and it was a testimony to me. How can somebody lose their kids and just worship God and smile? And I really counted it as a testimony until you track over years, and time has a way of telling on us. And I don't want to judge the man, but uh, he left his remaining family, spiraled off into the weeds. And I, and I have all, often thought, maybe that man missed the grief step. you got to sit in it for a minute feel it for a minute you got to experience it for a minute and it doesn't make us weak when we grieve because a spouse walked out now I don't believe God wants us to mourn greatly forever but we got to grieve and David didn't have time to grieve he didn't have time to mourn that much he didn't have time to grieve because people were picking up rocks to kill him you know when people are attempting murder sometimes you throw the Kleenex box away so he grieved and then he had to go to the next step hope now, I want to tell you what the bridge is, in my opinion, between grief and hope. Maybe you, if I said to some of you, if I said to everybody, how many of you in 2018, it's rhetorical, don't raise your hand. How many, 2018 was the greatest year you've ever experienced, or one of them, and you might raise your hand. And if I said, how many of you are glad that 2018 is in the rearview mirror, a bunch of you would raise your hand, because there was loss in that year. And so, God wants us to move from grief to hope. The Bible says in verse 6 that... Uh, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And he said to Abiathar the priest and Ahimelech's son, Bring me the ephod here. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. Now, the bridge between these two is a good old-fashioned cry. Psalm 34, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard my cry and delivered me from all of my troubles. Something powerful and cleansing about a cry. Gets us across the, it gets us across the chasm. People cried out in, uh, in Exodus, the Bible says, they cried out in slavery and God heard their cry went up to God and he sent them a deliverer. In Deuteronomy, God says to employers, be careful that you make sure you pay your employees lest they cry out to me and it reaches me and I count it as sin against you. First Kings, the Bible says, as a man of God, Elijah laid out on a dead boy and cried and God heard his cry. Isaiah says that... Uh, there's a scripture that says, when God hears your cry, he will answer. We've got some slides, and we're going to race through them. I'm not even going to read them. They're from the Psalms. Look at these slides from the Psalms. Uh, all of these have to do with cries. Next slide. All of these having to do with crying, crying out to the Lord. Next slide. Every single one of them is giving you a permission slip to cry out. Every single one of these cry out to God. And so David, he had a meeting. And the first meeting, you know, it was not with the men. The place is burnt down. They're weeping. They're grabbing rocks to kill him. All right, guys. Hey, gather around. All right, fellas. Here's the deal. I, got, I know it's kind of tough right now. I got, a, I got a blog I want you to take a look at and a podcast. Here's the link. I wanna, here's our self-help book. He didn't try to meet with them to encourage them. Nor did he expect them to encourage him. What about me? I lost all my stuff too. What about me? I'm hurting too. <laughs> no. The Bible says he strengthened himself in the Lord. Sometimes you got to meet with yourself. I'm self-employed, so sometimes I fire myself, and then I hire myself back, take myself out to lunch, and apologize to myself, forgive myself. Every now and then you got to have a meeting with yourself. He probably, and I don't, this is not biblical, but in my head it's, 
probably grabs about 10 of his most trusted guys and he knows that I'm not going to kill him. I'm like, fellas, I got to go over there in that cave. I got to have a meeting. I got to have a meeting. I got, you got one job. See those guys over there looking for rocks? Don't let them kill me. That's your job. Don't let them kill me. I'll be back. I think I'll be back. What does it look like when you encourage yourself? Well, if you read the Psalms, maybe if you took a page out of maybe like Psalm 145, it gets all alone. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I'll praise your name forever and ever, even on today, for great is the Lord. Come on, David, know this in your gut. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation is going to praise your work to another and declare your mighty acts. And in this cave, I'm going to meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They're going to utter the memory of God's great goodness and sing of his righteousness. The Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his work. David, his tender mercies over your children that are in captivity, frayed for their lives. His tender mercy is over their works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glorious majesty of your kingdom. And David remembered his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord lifts up those who fall and raises up all who are bowed down, I'm ready, I'm ready to go now. Give me the priest, give me, give me the ephod. And he says to God, God, should I go up? Verse 8, shall I get them? Shall I go get my stuff? God answers, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. <laughs> Let's watch God's position in all of this. He's not a petulant child. And David says, give me the priest. Give me the ephod. We're going to consult God. God, should I go get this troop? God didn't say, oh, well, very nice of you to ask me now, huh? You didn't ask me when you went up there three days ago. Oh, I bet you would like to know. Well, work it out, Turbo. Do your best. <laughs> this is the prodigal coming off of the pigsty and the dad coming off the porch sh sh should I go get my stuff back go go he he races to him go you're gonna he's about to fight against God but God doesn't hold that against him go for you shall recover all without fail when I read those words without fail it just told me sometimes we might be losers but that don't mean we got to be failures Go get your stuff. <laughs> he builds a bridge to hope. Then he's got to act. That's the other thing. He's got to act. That's the third stop along the way. So David went, verse 9, he and 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor. And those who stayed behind were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind who were so weary they could not cross the brook Besor. Now look at here. He's got a promise from God like we talked last night. But now he's still losing. He's lost a third of his army. A third. They get to a brook and 200 men say, No, I don't want to do it. I'm thirsty. I can't do it. I don't like this. I'm confused. Who are we working for again? We, I, I'm, I'm I miss my family. My feet hurt. I'm sitting down. 200 people. But he did not quit. He acted. You know, I, I think in, in America, there's a little bit of a consumer mentality when it comes to churches. And not enough of a lay hold to mentality. The consumer mentality says, well, I like church A because the preaching is really good, but the music is awful. Church B, the music is fantastic. The preaching is awful. Church C, the preaching and the music is great, but the coffee is generic. 
Church D has every single thing I need, but nobody spoke to me when I walked in. The old timers, I'm not trying to go back to the old days, but the old timers used to pray through on stuff and lay hold of stuff. What does that mean, lay hold? First Timothy says, you can't even get to heaven unless you lay hold of eternal life. That means seize and grasp. Matthew 11, 12 says, from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men. Lay hold to it. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 11, who among you, if you have a sheep that falls into a ditch, will not lay hold to it? Paul said in Philippians 3, this is the thing I do, forgetting what's behind. I press on to lay hold of that which Jesus has laid hold of for me. Today, I want you to lay hold of something that belongs to you. I want you to act upon it. So he, 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 he races it. He races. It's one thing to pursue. It's another thing to attack, and we'll get there. But he acted on what God gave him. I don't know if you remember this, and there's not very many old people like me in here, but 1996, I believe, December 17th, 1996, in Peru, uh, the ambassador to Japan was having a holiday party, and 14 militant Tupac Amaru guerrillas raided that party and took 72 hostages. It was an international incident. It was scandalous. It was terror. It was, there was terror before we really knew about 9-11 and all of that. And there was a president in Peru, Alberto Fujimoro. And President Fujimoro had to make some decisions. So by the end of December, just days later, he had built a, a plywood mock, mock-up of a plywood... Uh, of, of the compound, of the Japanese compound, he, he, to scale. He built it up with plywood. He recruited 140 of the best military people in Peru, like the Navy SEAL type people. He consulted America, he consulted Israel and the United Kingdom, but this was a Peruvian operation. And he, and he began to formulate a plan. They dug tunnels underneath the compound, 10 feet deep, 190 feet of tunnels, 24 hours a day, 24 miners, carrying 200 truckloads of dirt. When it got kind of loud, they would parade tanks around the compound, blasting military music. They put C4 everywhere. They put periscopes. They got psychological backgrounds on all 14 militants. They got all of the exercises completed, and they were totally and completely prepared. They found out that the, that the terrorists were playing soccer every day at 3 o'clock on the second floor of the compound. Like clockwork, 3 o'clock. So they knew exactly where they were going to be. Everything was in place, 140 people, all the explosives. There's 72 scared people in there. But somebody had to grab the walkie-talkie and say, go. Go. President Fujimura said, go. And in 16 mi minutes, all 14 militants were dead, and 71 of the 72 hostages were released. I think we have a photograph of it, of some of the Japanese people coming out. Maybe, maybe that's where you are today. You got the promise. You got to, you, you've practiced. You've got the religious and spiritual exercises and the disciplines. And your stuff is waiting on you. When I say your stuff, I'm not talking about Jaguars and Beamers and all that kind of stuff. Although if you have that, you want to donate it to a nonprofit, I can put you in touch <laughs> with a nonprofit. I'm talking about getting the joy of the Lord back in your house. Get your stuff back. Your family, salvation, get it back. Your destiny, your dream, your purpose, get it back. Somebody's just got to grab the microphone and say, now. And I don't want to pass by this real fast, but he also had to lead. Number four, he had to lead. And I'm going to read this because I think it's important. He comes along and has to exercise what I would consider some brilliant, brilliant leadership. We'll pick up the story there at verse number uh, 11. They found an Egyptian, an African, in the field and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate. And they gave him water and he drank. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him. Because he had eaten no bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. And David said to this African, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I got sick. 
We made an invasion of the southern area of the Chethrothites in the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. David said to him, can you take me down to this trip? He says, swear to me by God that you'll neither kill me nor let me fall into the hands of my master, and I'll take you down to the troop. Now, 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 time out. You didn't play with David. You didn't mess around with David. David, a man after God's own heart, will kill you. He'll cut you. They came to him one time and said, oh, hey, Dave, <coughs> we, we killed your enemy, the king. Yeah, we got him. We, we, we got him good. Oh, you thought it was no small thing to kill the king. Hey, you there, grab a sword, kill this guy. That was David. He didn't play. In fact, one place in the scriptures, it's rated R in places for violence and other things, and this is one of them. He laid all the enemy, made all the enemy lay down on the ground. Takes a, a strand of rope. All y'all dead. All y'all dead. You get to live. You just won the lottery. That's David. So this African who's boss was mean to him, left him because he got sick, says to David without even knowing who he's talking to, yeah, I burnt your house down. I burnt your house down. But instead of having a knee-jerk reaction, David had a moment of leadership. He, he did not see short-sighted revenge as his goal. Recovery was his goal. And he said, this is an opportunity for me. I can be kind to this guy. He had to lead himself. I know we tell our children, come on, Billy, you got to be a leader. Don't be a follower. I understand that. But not everybody can be leaders. If there's all people, all the people are leaders, nobody's on the curb to clap when the parade goes by. Okay? There's one leader, David, and 600 followers. So we may not all be leaders. I may not be able to lead you, but I got to lead myself. Proverbs 25, like a city whose walls are broken down as a man who lacks self-control. we got to control ourselves, and David did. And I don't have time to read it, but later on in this same chapter, when they're bringing all the stuff back, the Bible says in verse 22, wicked and worthless, wicked and worthless, wicked and worthless men started picking up, you know, that same stoneham spirit. He saw the 200 men who were at the brook Bezor. I'm too tired. I don't like it. I can't swim. I'm lonely. Ah, my feet hurt. We're not giving them anything. No, no, don't give them a, th well, give them their wives and kids. They're all ugly ones anyway. Get out of here now. Go on, get, get. David exercised leadership. He established policy. He says, uh, basically, no, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> Probably the same wicked and worthless guys wanting to kill him back. At, there's always wicked and worthless people. He establishes policy. He says the people who stay with the gear are going to get the same pay as the people who throw the spear. And then finally this, recovery. That's the seven stages of grief. That's the last one, and that's the last stop on David's path. Verse 16, when he had brought them down, there they were. I love that. The Egyptian brings them down. And there they were, verse 16, spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men. Like that's a little bit of people. That's all David had was 400 people. Not a man escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. And David recovered all. David recovered all. What did God say? You'll recover all and that without fail. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. He rescued his wives and nothing of theirs was lacking. Small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which had taken from them David recovered all I love this passage I wish I could see a video in heaven of this event they're partying and there they were dancing all the enemies of God all the enemies of David we got his wife his kids are crying they're celebrating but as our famous American philosopher Beyonce once said, you must not know about me. <laughs> there's, there's 400 sets of eyes, 800 eyeballs, give or take, looking at this party through the woods. They're just dancing, throw me another beer. Woo, what are we going to do with all this, all this plunder? Look at those animals. Woo, we're going to sell everybody. 
The Bible says for a day and a half, David killed these, the enemy. Now, I know we're not killers, but we have an enemy of our soul who may be gloating over you. We got him. We got him. My friend Lee McBride uses me as a sermon illustration. He said, hell had a staff meeting and said, what? Somebody's responsible for Joe Phillips. He was on his way to an abortion clinic and his mother, and somebody dropped the ball, and then he was abused, and somebody dropped the ball and let him keep on living, and then he got his parents got a divorce, and he went through a church split. Some heads are going to roll. Maybe they've been celebrating over you, the enemy of your soul. <laughs> She's so depressed. <laughs> Maybe they've been celebrating. But as long as the Lord is alive, you can recover it all. Now, Joe, I, 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 I can't get my husband back who passed away. No. But you can get your joy back and your sense of security and inner peace back. You can get that back. Just like Joe got it all back and then more and more and more and more. I know you're all big football fans down here, and if you're a Kentucky fan, this will be a hard two minutes for you. There was a, there was a uh, 1992, I think, or 90, 2002, the miracle at the Bluegrass. I don't know if you remember that. The Kentucky Wildcats, the lowly Kentucky Wildcats in 2002 were playing in Lexington, the mighty LSU Tigers. And LSU was ranked 16th in the country, and they were dominating. But there was a 13-3 run in the fourth quarter. And Kentucky tied LSU. Kentucky tied LSU 27-27. And everybody was kind of going crazy. And then they got the ball back and they drove down. And then the big offensive guard called timeout after first down. And it messed everything up. So they just sent the field goal kicker in on second down. And kicked the field goal. Now Kentucky is winning 30-27. to And it's a giant upset in the making. They kick off and they pin down LSU at the nine-yard line with 11 seconds left. They call a sweep right and they throw and they get a ball to the 26-yard line. But now they got tw they got two seconds to go 74 yards. And the quarterback Randall had a notoriously weak arm when it came to distance. He's a good athlete, couldn't throw the ball far. And Kentucky was coming out of the stands and they were losing their mind. And they, they hike the ball, and at two seconds left, they're starting to climb on the goal post. He throws it just as hard as he can throw it. He's 25 yards short of the end zone, upset of upsets. They give the coach a Gatorade bath. They give Kentucky's coach, we got a picture of it there, a Gator, there he is getting doused with Gatorade. But the problem was, with no time left on the clock and everybody storming the field, one of the Kentucky players tipped the ball to a running back named Devery Henderson who ran underneath it and ran straight into the end zone. Even Jefferson Pilot put up the wrong score. Fireworks were going off in the stadium, and they had just lost. I love that image for you. When all of hell comes against your family, and you think it may be over, and they're saying it's over, you got to hail Mary. His name is the son of Mary. And as long as Jesus lives on the earth, you can get your stuff back. Yeah. Will you stand to your feet as the musicians come? You know, I, I told him last night, when I borrowed money eight years ago from my mother to pay my light bill, our lights went out as an evangelist just barely into this thing a year and a half. I didn't know how I could survive. I, to I told my kids, the we're going to go camping tonight. This is awesome. Dad, it's July in the south. I know. Isn't it fun? No. <laughs> I cut the power off. If you told me then all those statistics I just read off my phone, and they're conservative statistics. It could be more than all of that that God would have given us ability to take five people and produce a film in Thailand. It would have been beyond my comprehension. It's not beyond his comprehension. Go get your stuff back. I will not let you go, Lord, 
until you bless me. Have that kind of lay hold of mentality. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to lay hold of that which God has laid hold of for me. My joy, my family, my purpose, my destiny, my mental health, my physical health, my peace of mind, my business, my finances. Just because you lose doesn't mean you have to fear. Failure. There was a guy that started a business called Trafo Data. It was a notorious failure, but he went on and he was okay. His name was Bill Gates. He started something else. One guy got fired because they said he lacked creativity. He was not creative. Instead of just stewing in it, he said, well, I'll start something else. His name was Walt Disney. One guy st started three businesses that were horrible failures, but Milton Hershey went on to do okay for himself. 1959, a guy bought the, Cle the Cleveland Pipers, and it went bankrupt, and he was a, an abysmal failure. But later, he joined something called the New York Yankees, and George Steinbrenner would do okay. And I study people that are successful in podcasts, and I just, I listened to uh, this one podcast, and they, they interviewed the lady that started Spanx, Instagram, uh, uh, Larbars, uh, Dell Computer, all these great billion-dollar companies, these startups that started in 2007, they sell them for a billion dollars. Soul Cycle started in 2007 and they both walked away with 90 million apiece. And I found out there are two things, if you listen to all of them from all their backgrounds, two strands of continuity. Number one, almost every single one, if not every one of them, failed miserably at something. And number two, they all had a tenacious ability not to quit. Where are you at today? Where are you at today? Bow your heads, would you? Father, I thank you for this group of people, wonderful people. Pray you bless them, help them, strengthen them, encourage them. Tonight, I've got I to ask you a question this morning before we leave. I have to. I'm an evangelist, and I have to. I have to. I'm mandated. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if your heart stopped beating that you would go to heaven? doctor said before my brother-in-law's face hit the Georgia clay that he was dead so if the doctor's right and the Bible's right before his face hit the Georgia clay his feet hit street of gold in heaven do you know that you know that you know to be absent from the body you be present with the Lord if you don't know that I promise you there's nothing you've done that God can't forgive you of he can forgive you of every single thing every single thing mass murderers can be forgiven and covered in the blood and walk on streets of gold there's nothing that you have done that God cannot forgive you of Paul was a murderer and he wrote a third of the New Testament I'm gonna to count to three as a point of reference if you're away from God a million miles or a hundred feet when I count to the when I say the number three, I want you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray with you right where you stand. And you're going to say, I'm away from God. And I don't want to be away from God. I want to walk with God. The kind of God that will run to me like God did to David and say, go get your stuff. Go get your life back. One, Joe, I need God. I'm away from him. Two, Joe, I want to, I want to put my head on the pillow tonight and know that I know that I know that I know that I would go to heaven if my heart stops beating. Are you ready? He's ready. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. This is what he's living for. This is what he died for. You ready? When I say this number three, just lift your hand up and leave it up for a minute, a second or two. I'll tell you to put it down all over this room. You say, Joe, I'm away from God, but I don't want to be away from him another second. Pray for me. Three, raise your hand if that's you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, hallelujah, put your hands down. You're crazy about these people, Lord. You love them with an everlasting love. They're the apple of your eye. I saw eight hands, there may have been more than that, Lord. I pray for all of them that raised their hand and said, I'm away from God and I want God to write my name in heaven. That you'll help them understand, repent, and believe, and trust only in Jesus Christ for their eternal lives as they pray a simple prayer. You that raise your hand, pray a prayer like this. We'll I'm going to stutter through it on purpose. I want you to make it your prayer. You can whisper it out loud. You can whisper it to yourself, to the Lord. Something like this. Here I am, God. God, here, here I am. This is me. And, and I know I've had bad thoughts. And I know I've said bad things. I know I've done wrong things. Now, to come into my heart and life, 
forgive me. I, I confess my sins. Every bad thing I've thought and done and said. And stuff I didn't do that I should have done. But I also confess something else. I'm going to count to three. I want everybody from the leadership team to the newest visitor to say out loud of your mouth at the count of three. Out loud, Jesus is Lord. Ready? One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Awesome. Back to our prayer. So, so here I am, God, and with my mouth I just confess Jesus is Lord. And in my heart I believe God raised Jesus from the dead. Live in me. Be with me. Help me to live for you. I don't understand all this, but I want all this. I want it. I want it. Help me to live for you. I give you my life. And now Roswell Assembly of God prays over every person who prayed that prayer that nothing would steal what you planted in their heart. No birds of the air, no cares of the earth, no difficult places. But God, they're going to find roots that go way down to the, to the living water, the tap water. And they're going to have fruit that goes way up to the sky of discipleship. And their fruit will remain in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God some praise in his house today. I'm praying for sick people tonight as long as it takes. It shouldn't take that long. But my last prayer here to both of your hands raised up if, if you're able to. Somebody in this room says, I got to get my stuff back. I'm determined I'm going to act on this. I'm going to get my stuff back. I'm going to get my stuff. I'm going to get what Jesus has laid hold of for me. Raise your hand. Get, a, get them their stuff back, Lord. Give them a promise, God. Help them to know that they're not failures. And I pray that their family that's uh, rebellious is going to come back in, into the kingdom of heaven. I pray that their joy is going to live strong into their homes. I pray their health is coming back. Their finances are coming back. Their vision is coming back. Their purpose is coming back. Their ministry is coming back. Lord, you're going to give them their stuff back. Fruit that will remain in Jesus' name. If you believe it, say amen.